like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. I must tell you we're back here. I almost started speaking of recalls, but you know, we switched to English now. We have a fascinating man here. And I must also say we really struggle to get this recording to you. We deserve full points for trying. And it's a new technique we're trying as well. And I also have to say, um, I am recording from the hotel room. And so we're cleaning outside. There might be a little bit of noise. I apologize for that. It cannot be helped. But Andrew Botmo, you are very welcome here. You're down south at the moment in Australia, but you're ex-South African. And you had a, what I consider to be a very great uh, career in the army for the time you oh. were there. Because you came just at the right time. A lot of things happened to you. And that's why we're here. And we also want to know about your pictures because you're something of an artist, a painter. He sent me some pictures of that. It's impressive. So let us hear your story. Where did the start for you? And uh, do you come from a military family, perhaps? Or were you just called up, like all of us? Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you for everything that you do. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not from a military fa uh, family at all, no. I, I was called up like everybody else. Uh, but I matriculated from John Hall Technical High School in 1976 with a certificate three in motor mechanics. Uh, I then decided to try and do an engineering degree, but soon found that my um, mathematics, physics, and chemistry were not strong enough for me to do a degree. So there were rumors at the, at the time that the army was going to be increased to two-year call-up, and I decided to uh, have myself called up into the army and was then called up to uh, 14th Field Regiment in Potchefstroom, where I did my basics. Um, after basics, uh, military intelligence came around and were looking for volunteers, and I volunteered to go to military intelligence, um, and it took about two months to do my uh, clearance because you had to have a, uh, a top secret clearance uh, before they accepted you, and then I, I, I went to uh, military intelligence where we were uh, in training at Fort Klapperkop for a while, and then uh, I was... Um, I w went down to ca counterintelligence, uh, where we basically worked in an ops room, uh, recording any incidents at any army base um, around the country. Um, one day at tea time, two Omana came back from the border, and I was so impressed with their story that I immediately went and saw our, our um, adjutant officer, Charlie Lobb, and volunteered to go up to the border. Um, by that afternoon at about three o'clock, I was summoned to see Neil Barnard, uh, and he then informed me that he couldn't tell me what I was uh, going to do up on the border, but that I was leaving the next morning, and uh, I was to report to uh, Colonel Philip Simon Dupria in Rundu. I, um, I thanked him, and, and the next day uh, went to uh, Waterkloof, and um, and flew up, but I had by mistake taken the wrong plane, and I landed up in Vintuk. And when I la landed in Vintuk, uh, Const uh, General Constant Falun was was standing on a on a uh, at a parapet, and he looked and he saw my owl on my beret, and he asked me where I was going. To which I replied that I was to report to Colonel Dupria in Rundu. And he said to a lieutenant, Lieutenant, take that man, put him on the jeep and take him out to that Dakota that's busy taxiing out on the airway, on the runway. So this guy, duly, this, this Dakota was still moving when they threw my ball sack into the plane and I jumped and they, they pulled me into the plane. And he said to me, that'll take you to Khurutfantin. From Khurutfantin, you make your own arrangement. So I flew that night and we probably landed at Khurutfantin around about eight o'clock that night. And I just slept, there were, there were um, walkways, concrete walkways with a roof over it. And I just slept on the concrete floor that night. The next morning, I made my way to the Transito Center and asked them that I wanted a flight to, to, to Rundu. And they said to me, I, the last flight to Rundu had already left, but that they would get me there. 
that there was a driver who was to take gas up to uh, Rundu and he was leaving just after lunch. I should just sit in the transit room and wait for him. Whilst I was waiting in the transit room, I saw all these guys that were coming back that had been to the border that were now on their way home. And the fear in their eyes told me that there was a war going on up there. I could just see they, they weren't boys anymore. These guys were men when they came back. So after lunch, I got the, 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 the guy with the gas bottles in his truck. He arrived and I still was uh, concerned because we only had one R1 between the two of us. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, if we get attacked, I'm taking the R1. <laughs> but little did I know that it was very safe between Grootfontein and Rundu that the real danger is really once you get into Angola. In Angola. So I arrived at Rundu about four o'clock that afternoon and the, uh, the reported to the colonel and he was standing there with, uh, and, and, and Tony da Costa, who was the radio man, was also there. And the colonel jumped about four, two foot off the ground and he grabbed his, his hat and he threw it into the ground and said, where the hell have you been? And I explained to him, I said, sorry, sorry, colonel, I... Uh, I got onto the wrong plane, so I had to wait until now to get here. So he says, can you at least speak Portuguese? So I said to him, no, I can't. So he says, have you got a truck license? I said, no, I don't. He said, can you at least drive a truck? I said, yes. He said, bring me that Unimog. And this is the first time I'd ever seen a Unimog. So I got into the Unimog, and the Unimog has got three levers. One is for the winch, one lever selects forward or neutral or backwards and the other one is your gears you've got six gears so you've got six gears in reverse if you so choose but i didn't know this and i was fiddling around trying and i couldn't get this thing into gear and eventually i just hear this heck of a noise clang and i jumped out and i just somehow engaged the uh, winch and pulled the whole bumper into the winch and he was cross this colonel he shouted at tony tony teach that bugger how to drive the thing and uh, so Tony got into the truck with me, said, come, let me show you. And he said to me, OK, we're going to our camp now. I don't want you to get a fright, but you're going to see terrorists, what you think what seems to be terrorists in our camp. So I went to the camp and there uh, he says, these are our mighties, which is UNITA. So there I met uh, Dr. Jonas Avimbi and his 2IC, Dr. Uh, Mr. Puna. And... Um, I then learned that our job was basically that the CIA was supplying uh, arms and ammunition uh, from, and they were landing it in, in the Congo and our retired pilots would fly, would fly up to the Congo, get the material that the Americans had sent over and then they'd fly it to Rundu. And the camp that we had boarded onto the airport from Rundu and we had our own gate so that nobody in the camp could see that we were ferrying stuff directly from the airport into our camp. And in our camp, we had a big Wendy house that we lived in. It had three bed, three rooms. One was an open porch in the middle and then two rooms on the sides. The one room was kept for Dr. Savimbi when he slept over. And we, the three, we, there were three of us that were with military intelligence. And then we also had a black guy that was the driver. And then two Portuguese guys, Sierra Amalio and Sierra Lopes. They were... Uh, the colonel's age, or maybe a bit older, the colonel at that stage, I think, was about 36. Um, and we were 19-year-olds, 18, 19-year-olds. And so we had direct access to, to, to offload the planes and then take it to our base. And at the base, we had various tents uh, erected as well. And we stored the ammunition and, and stuff in the tents. And then if we needed to take food to UNITA, in a, we supplied them wherever in, an, in southern Angola and that. We load up at the, at the kitchen. We load up all the boxes of food and stuff like that. So that was our job. We were to supply food to the UNITA troops and ammunition and, and munitions to, to them. So uh, as I say, yes, I met Dr. Savimbi and he's quite an intelligent man. He could, I think he could speak seven languages. My colonel, uh, Dupria, um, could speak French and Portuguese and English and Afrikaans. 
Um, so yes, and then Tony Da Costa, of course, could speak English and Portuguese and a little bit of Afrikaans. And then Henk Fisser was the other guy that was uh, as well, there as well. And he could speak a bit of Portuguese and English and Afrikaans. And I also, after about three months, was I could make myself understood in Portuguese. Um, so that's what we did. We um, we supplied UNITA every now and again. There would be uh, UNITA troops in our camp, and I would have to go and fetch them food. Um, and then we'd take them, and we'd also uh, move them from battlefield to battlefield. So shortly after arriving um, was Ops Reindeer, and uh, we were sitting on the outskirts of Kasinga, ready to to supplies the paratroopers with UNITA troops so that UNITA could take credit for um, for the battle. However, the battle took a lot longer than they anticipated initially, and, and we had to beat a right IC retreat because by the time uh, we were supposed to place the UNITA troops in there, the foreign press were all over the place, and we had to then move back back to, to Southwest Africa. Um, so yes, we we that we kept on doing that. I I know that at, at one stage uh, we were we had a, a a training camp in 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 the Caprivi called Delta. So you had Alpha, which was uh, 31 battalion, then Bravo, which is 32 battalion, then Charlie, which was 33 battalion, and then Delta, which was our camp where we trained the UNITA, and not just we, but the Rekis trained them, and then obviously Echo, which is Fort Dopis. And then after four doppies, um, um, there were two other camps, Mpacha and then um, um, the one that was attacked later. So um, one day the colonel said to me, I, I was to go to uh, Delta, and he said to me, somewhere on the Caprivi, a guy is going to flag me down, uh, and he's a Reki, and, and, and that is, he's a, he's a KO, Ka Andre Diederichs, and I must pick him up and take him to Delta. So it was raining cats and dogs, and this guy flagged us down, and, and we sort of thought we'd let him into the cab, but he was so wet, he decided he'd stand, and he was a tough bugger old diddies, uh, Andre Diederichs. So we picked him up and uh, took him to, to Delta, and he was then later joined by um, Don van Sale. And, and Don and Don and Didi's were like two brothers, two peas in a pot. Uh, Don was a big guy. Um, he he was probably about six foot two and and built and strong. Uh, he had uh, done about five years. Uh, he had completed five years of study as a doctor at Stellenbosch University, and had then had a, a love disappointment and then decided to uh, join the Rekis and stop studying medicine and join the Rekis. Because he was so big, Aldan liked to carry an LMG, um, and he was quite quite a strong guy. Um, he would be probably about 70 today because he was about six years older than, than I am. So Didis and Don, when, when they weren't training the UNITA soldiers, I became aware that they really were looking out for us whenever we had to go into southern Angola. Um, because on some occasions the um, the colonel scrambled a chopper and landed in front of us if we were on our way into Angola to to tell us that there'd be an, an ambush set up for us and we must turn around and go back to base. I knew that we had the Rekis back, that they were looking out for us because it would be worrying because in those, when you're Bundu bashing, you, you're not doing very far every day but, but and you can hear that that truck coming probably for 10, 15 kilometers or from 15 kilometers away. So if somebody did want to set up an ambush, it would be very, very easy to do. Um, on one occasion, the colonel regularly went back to Pretoria, say for a week or so, to, to probably to report back to headquarters what was happening and so on. And on one occasion, on a Friday, he called me and he said to me, Andrew, when Tony brings back the truck on Sunday morning. You must load the truck and go to Mavinga with the following list of supplies. So I said, okay. So I 
waited and waited and waited for Tony and no Tony. And eventually at about 10 o'clock, I realized he must have had a breakdown and I must now make another plan. So I walked over to the vehicle park and I saw the sergeant on duty and I explained to him that I needed a vehicle park, a, a vehicle, a, a Megiris Deutsch truck. And he said, no, that's fine. Uh, where's your uh, driver's license? I said to him, I don't have a driver's license for a truck. He said, well, there's no way I'm giving you a truck. So I scratched my head and I didn't know what to do. And I was walking out through the gate of the vehicle park when I looked up and I saw there was somebody with the Megiddo Deutsch bringing the truck back to the vehicle park. And I knew now what I had to do. So I stuck my hand up and stopped the truck, the driver. And as he stopped, I pulled his door open and I pulled him out of the truck and I took the truck. And I took it to our camp next to the airport there. And I was busy loading ammunition on the truck when the uh, vehicle park sergeant arrived in a Jeep and he wanted to come through the gate. And I pointed my R1 at him and said to him, listen, I have instructions to shoot anybody that comes through that gate that hasn't got a top secret security clearance and has got no business because there was a, everything was on a need to know basis. So he left. I finished loading the truck and then I left uh, for Mavinga. I left and they tried to, the MPs at the gate tried to block me from leaving by dropping the boom, but I just snapped that boom in two and drove through. The next morning at about tea time, I was at 33 battalion on the Caprivi and I was running low on diesel. So I, I went into the camp and I got to the petrol, the filling station in, in, in uh, 33 battalion. The, you, you, you drove up a long road, you, well, you turned left into the camp and then drove up to a long road and the camp was to your right hand side and the fuel depot was on your left hand side. And I drove left and these guys had to walk probably about 600 meters to go and fetch their tea. So the two guys manning the petrol station or the filling station, they were on their way out to tea when I drove in. So I passed them on the way into the filling station. I, I stopped, filled in the, um, the, 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 the documentation that I was taking petrol. And the Megillus Deutsch has got two fuel tanks, two diesel tanks, one behind the other. And I was filling the front diesel tank. And as I filled it, I smelt and I thought, no, no hell, I, I put in petrol by mistake. I didn't put in diesel, I put in petrol. So I looked around and on the Tiffy's uh, table was a shifting spanner. So I got, went and fetched the shifting spanner and undid the thumb plug and drained all the petrol. I didn't have anywhere to, anywhere to catch it up in. So I just drained it on the floor, put back the thumb plug and then filled both tanks with diesel. And I was busy leaving when the two guys came back from tea and they must have seen all that petrol flowing all over the place and they tried to stop me and I swerved to miss them and then I was looking behind me to see what they were doing and as I looked up in front of me I was heading straight at the camp's water tank the the, the pillars of the two pillars of the water tank and I hit these two pillars and the water tank toppled, toppled over the truck. Didn't touch the truck, but toppled over it and I just made my escape. I got out of there and, and then um, went to Mapacha. And just before you get to Mapacha, you turn left uh, and you cross the river. There's, a, there's, there's a, a tent and there's a normally a white sergeant with a Bushman group and they're manning the, they're manning the post and they, they check that we, that we go through and they make, make notes of who's going through. And uh, so you go cross into Angola at just before you get to Mapacha and then you head up to Jamba and then Kuitukwanaval uh, uh, and then Mavinga. So this took me, I, I then did my drop off and then came back and it was the then a Sunday after that Sunday, so I was out for a whole week. And about nine o'clock at night, I arrived back in Burundi on a Sunday night. And I was duly just arrested there and put into DB. So I spent the night in DB and the next morning, they, uh, the sergeant again came and he marched me on orders quickly and he took me to the colonel's office and they read out all the charges of theft and damage to state property and all the charges that they had. And um, 
and they asked me what I was going to plead, and I said guilty. So the colonel intervened, and he said, listen, Sergeant, what you want to send this man to jail for, I want to give him a medal for. Leave him alone. Andrew, go back to, um, to Tony and them. Uh, you're going on the next mission. So that was the end of that. But of Didi's, Didi's and Don got to hear of it, and uh, they thought it was a heck of a joke. Um, shortly after that, they, they pulled a prank on me, which I only realized afterwards. The colonel came to me and he said to me, Andrew, uh, I've got, I've, I want you to take a load into Angola uh, and I'm sending a UNITA guy with you to show you where you must go. So I said, okay, colonel. So this guy is Portuguese. I don't speak that much Portuguese and he doesn't speak a word of English or Afrikaans. So we're driving and we're now into Angola. Suddenly I get there's two cardboard signs, one on the left-hand side of the road, the other one on the right-hand side of the road, the one in English, danger, landmines, and the one on the other side in Afrikaans, Gefar, Langmeiner. I stopped the truck. Now I'm trying to explain to the Portuguese guy that I'm saying to him, Minas, man, Minas, Minas, but he can't read English or Afrikaans, but he's showing me Go ahead, go ahead. And I just cannot communicate with this guy. And I stand there for, stay there for about 10 minutes and then think and then decide, okay, we'll give this a go. And I, we had the belief uh, with that if you were doing more than 60 kilometers an hour, you'd be relatively safe because the landmine would go off behind you and not under you. <laughs> Probably not true. But any case, so I pulled off and I raced down the street and I tell you, my backside was itching all the way to under my neck. And then afterwards, I realized this must have been Didis and Don. They were probably sitting on a copy somewhere with the binoculars watching me to see what I was going to do. <laughs> but at the time, it wasn't that funny, I can tell you that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I must tell you as well that the um, the Tiffies didn't like us at all either, you know, because we'd draw these vehicles from the vehicle park and they'd be new. Some of them would be at, would have like 30 kilometers on the clock. <laughs> and we'd take a brand new Magiris Deutsch truck and then go bundu bashing into southern Angola. And, you know, the sand is very loose. So you take a corner and the thing just flips and goes forward, you know. So, And then you hit trees that are like 100 mil diameter trees. Thorn tree. So, and you snap that tree off like nothing. That, that Magiris Deutsch has got a, like a strong bumper and you snap that tree off and the tree falls over the, over the truck and ends the roof in, breaks the windscreen. So we, bring, we take a truck out new and when we bring it back, it would have no windscreen, the roof would be dented, the lights would be out, the brake pipes would be off under the diff, wouldn't have brakes. Uh, no flicky lights, nothing, no, nothing worked. So the Tuffies didn't like us much. Uh, of course, one of the jobs that Sierra Amalio and Sierra Globs did is that at the end, once a month, they would load the Unimog full of uh, coffee, sugar, tea, milli meal and rice uh, for many of the uh, kraal. And then they would traverse southern Angola from kraal to kraal to hear about enemy movements and what they were carrying with them, uh, what type of uh, arms they had and, and stuff like that. And um, on one occasion, they couldn't do it. And the colonel asked myself and Tony de Costa to do it. And so we went, we went and at, at one of the kraals, there was a vervet monkey tied by a thong to a tree, a little small baby vervet monkey. And I said to Tony, listen, Tony, ask this guy if I give him my medics bag, if he'll give me the monkey. And the guy said, no. I said, okay, what if I give him my medics bag and I give him a water bottle? Will he give me the monkey? He said, no. Okay. If I give him my medics bag and the water bottle and my bush jacket, will he give me the monkey? And the guy came back, no. And then I said, what if I add another 10 rand to that? And that which was a lot of money in those days, not that I know where he would spend it in Angola. But the guy then explained to me, he said, no, man, the, the owner of the monkey is in the bush and he can't negotiate this monkey on his behalf. 
Asitu Tony, Tony, tell him I, I cocked my R1. I said to him, Tony, tell him, end of negotiations, I'm now taking that monkey. And so I took the monkey and got into the truck with it. And as it grabbed me on my, on my chest, it grabbed me like a little baby grabbed hold of me. A thousand fleas got onto me and I was infested with fleas. So I called the monkey Floyd immediately because I deserved it. His name was Floyd. It was a female little monkey and she was still a baby and needed, needed, uh, I, I needed to uh, put her in nappies and at night and stuff like that. But she, um, she was a very good distraction for me to have um, because I, I, if she kept me up at night putting nappies on and taking it to the bathroom, which was about a kilometer away from camp. I'd put her in a Jeep and take her and go and wash her and put nappies on her and go and sleep again, you know, and she she got grrr in my ear <laughs> and put her snout in my ear as well. So old Floyd, old Floyd, and then the next morning, I was so full of fleas, I went to the hospital and said to them, listen, uh, I'm full of fleas. I've, I've got this monkey and, and full of fleas. So they said to me, yes, here's a bottle of dog shampoo. Go and wash yourself and the monkey. And that sorted the problem out. I, I, I cured the fleas. So oh, Floyd was my companion always. I took her everywhere with me. And she hated the Unita Blacks. So anywhere black she hated because <laughs> they had obviously not treated her all, with, all that well. I tried to set her free, but she uh, didn't, she needed, she needed somebody to look after her. So she always kept by me, even though she didn't have a rope around her anymore, anything like that. She always sat, sat on my shoulder, slept with me at night, went wherever I had to go. The only time when I did have to put a, a rope around her was if we, if we were on the back of a Magiris truck taking uh, stuff into Angola, it would be full of millimeals. I'd sit on the back of the millimeal, milli bags because that's the safest place to be if you do eat a, a landmine is to sit on top of millibule bag. And the shaking got her so mad that she would want to jump off the truck and I'd have to reel her in with a rope. Uh, anyway, so well, Floyki was a constant companion. One day uh, I had to go and f fetch food from the kitchen for Dr. Savimbi and his, his people. Well, first let me tell you, uh, Dr. Savimbi, I... One day I fetched, before I had Floyd, one day I went and fetched food for Dr. Savimbi and his people at the kitchen. And we used to get big square stainless steel dishes. And the, 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 the colonel would probably phone and say, look, he wants extra meals for 40 people or how much, you know. And then the, the, I'd go and fetch these stainless steel bowls of meat and pumpkin and rice and sauce and whatever. And, and I take it to uh, the, the, the central room where, where we were, were going to eat. And there was a table and chairs. And I was one day, I was sitting, talking to Dr. Savimbi. And he was, he's a very interesting character. You know, I was engrossed in what he was saying. And I, I could see he was distracted. And he looked down and he said to me, is that enough for you? And when I looked down, this guy from UNITA was putting mash on my plate. And it was high like a pyramid. And he put us spoonful of mash on the on the plate and it, it was so much that it started sliding down this this this, this pyramid and he'd grab it with a spoon and plaster it all the way back up again and then it would slide down the other side and he plastered it back up again and I'll talk to Savimbi said do you think that's enough for you? So I looked down at this pyramid of mash and I said to him geez Dr. Savimbi this is probably enough for all of us. To which he said to me well let me teach you your first Portuguese word he says in our culture, he will not stop until you say enough. And the word for enough is shega. So that was the first Portuguese word I learned from Dr. Savimbi himself. So I said shega to the guy and the Dr. Savimbi told him to take all the stuff off the plate and start again. So <laughs> that was the first word I learned. Now today I can still speak some of the words. I probably very learned very quickly. I learned, I've forgotten a lot, but un, dois, tres, and bon dia, bon tarde, bon, bon noite, and all that, you know. I, and, and I know that lake is milk, and it, it would come back to me, but you never forget the swear words, you know, right for there and all those things. But yeah, so um, another day after I had Floyd, I, I also was tasked to go and fetch food 
for Dr. Savimbi and his, his men that were there. So I went to the kitchen, we got the food, and I got back to the camp and I started carrying in the dishes. And as I came back from delivering the first amount of dishes, I looked and on the Jeep stood Floyer and one of the dishes that had pumpkin in it, the, the lid had come off. And here our Floyer was standing, hands four feet, standing chest high in the pumpkin and licking this pumpkin and he had this sheer look of bliss on his eyes. You couldn't have given him a better dish. You know? He was licking this pumpkin. So I quickly grabbed him by the scruff of his neck, neck and I took a spoon and I plastered that pumpkin flat and took it inside, you know. Not surprisingly, when they asked me if I wanted pumpkin that night, I said, no thanks. I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel like pumpkin today. <laughs> so that was our floyd um, so yes, on another occasion, um, uh, later on, I, I had contracted malaria and, um, and that made me want to go back home. After that, I just wanted to go and see my mother again. You know? And so after that, I, I went to the colonel. I said to him, listen, colonel, I think you must uh, organize for a replacement for me and let me teach him. I'd, uh, I'd like to go home. And um, um, I was told... Whenever I wanted to go home, I could just put my hand up and that's it, I can go home. So that was after I'd done about four months on the border. I, I decided I wanted to go home. And my replacement came. It was a, a, also a fun sale. Uh, he was from Malmesbury. He's a lekker brei aan hem gehad. And now Henk, Henk van Seil was his name. And now Henk came and he, he was... He, was put in the, under my wing and I had to train him. Now, whilst I was training him, one day the colonel said to me, listen, uh, Ramaphosa, uh, 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 not Ramaphosa, uh, Ramalio, Ramalio is, uh, has gone to interrogate the tribes and find out about enemy movements. And uh, he's only got enough diesel with him to make it back to the Krytuan. Now, the Krytuan was where three barbed wires met each other. The one was on the one side was a Bambulant, and then the other side was a Kavangulant. And then there was a wire that um, went up into Angola. And we, Inc. and myself, waited there, and no, no, no uh, Ramalio. And we waited another day, no more Ramalio. And early the next morning, Ramalio comes walking over the border from, from Angola. He walked, so I asked him what's wrong. He said, no, I must come. The truck is broken down. The, his Unimog is broken down. So Hink and I, we've got a Unimog as well, but we haven't got a tow rope. But I did have some spanners in the, in the car with me. So we, we, we took him and we went into Angola all the way where, to where his uh, uh, Unimog had broken down. And I quickly diagnosed that uh, their diesel, his diesel pump had backed up. So I decided, well, I don't have a tow rope. The only way to do this now is I've got my Unimog diesel pump. It doesn't matter. There's nothing wrong with it. So what I'll do is I'll drive south for about three kilometers, then stop the Unimog, strip off the diesel pump, walk back to the other diesel, the other Unimog, and then fit the, the, the diesel pump, and then prime it of air, and then start that Unimog and then drive past this other Unimog three kilometers south and repeat the process. So it took us quite a number of days to get back to Southwest Africa. And as we, 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 we crossed back over the border early one morning, and as we crossed over, I saw, yes, I hear the clump rattles from 61 mechanized brigade and the, the um, major who was second in command at, uh, 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 with military intelligence was a Major Hugo. He was a parabat. And he was excited to see me and he said, Yeah, but my, where the hell have you been? So I explained to him what had happened to us. And he said, Yes, like man. About two days or so after we had left to go to the Krytuan, two or three days later, there was a massive punch up. At Krytuan, some a patrol had walked into a, a terrorist ambush, a huge ambush, and they thought that we'd been captured and that we'd been taken prisoner, prisoner of war. And 
the, the, the uh, Major and 61 Mechanized Battalion were on their way in to come and look for us. So, obviously, it was great relief in Rundu that we hadn't been captured. And um, the Colonel um, then said that he would send me home, but he didn't. He was building a house in Roya Kral, so he, he thought, well, I, I've got some free labor now. So he was building a house, so, and then he sent me to the, um, to the Saagmiele in Rundu to go and pick up indigenous wood, the most beautiful wood. And then I take truckloads of the timber and load it onto the, onto the flossy for him. And uh, that was flown back to Bartikloof base and these builders probably picked it up from there and built his house. I did see his house uh, later with Dr. Savimbi, uh, when Dr. Savimbi was in, in, in Pretoria and I'd taken them to Johannesburg and stuff like that, but I'll speak about, but about that later. And he, he had built a beautiful staircase in his house with that indigenous timber. So yes, um, that was that was that. So on one occasion, I uh, I just want to tell you on one occasion, I got back from a mission at about ten o'clock at night, and Lise and Don were on their way back to the states for some well-deserved rest and relaxation, and they were having a hell of a party, and they summoned me to join them. And when I got there, all Lise and all Don were and uh, they had about three, three bottles of rum there, but they only had one small can of Coke. So then he grabs a fire bucket and he hoists a splash of Coke in this fire bucket and he fills it with rum and he says to me, drink. So I protest, here it is, this is just plain rum. And so he, he pulls his pistol from his webbing and he points the gun at my head and he says, I said, drink. So I said, yes, yeah, okay, no more arguments from me. That was the last I remember. I woke up the next morning. I woke up lying in, 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 on a parade ground with my mouth full of sand and stones. Apparently that night before I fired off flares, I cleared on UNITA's Captain Bok and I'd marched them all over the place until I passed out. Now this Captain Bok was a character as well. He was a dwarf, dwarf and he had two uh, Colt 45s and they were uh, Stainless steel Colt 45, and you, you know how big those Colt 45s are. Well, he, when he had them on his holsters, they cleared the ground by about probably just an inch, you know. When I saw him later on a different operation, he had lost his right hand. He only had one Colt 45 strapped to his side. And I asked him, what's happened to your hand? And he said to me, no, man, he was, he was teaching his troops how to uh, load a landmine, an anti-tank miner. You've got a primary charge, which is basically a vial filled with liquid. And as soon as that liquid, as soon as you crush that vial, when it, uh, it gets, mixes with oxygen, then that goes off. And that's your primary charge, which sets off your main charge. He was teaching them how to uh, prime the landmine. And one of the troops had this vial in his hand and he was shaking it enough. Now, if you shake it, it can also go off. And he grabbed this guy's hand, and as he grabbed his hand, the, the charge went off and blew both of their hands off. So he only had his left hand when I saw him subsequently uh, afterwards. So yeah, that, uh, that was what we did. Um, I then, uh, eventually the, uh, the, the colonel had me driving the timber and one Friday, he went back to Pretoria again, and I went to the Major, and I said to him, Major, you go. I said, he says, yeah, I said, man, the Colonel's buggering me around. He, he said he'd send me home, but he's now letting me drive all this timber to the Flossie for him. Where am I going to go home? So he said, leave it to me. So about an hour later, he comes to me, and he says, bodies, I've got, you, I've got good news and bad news. He says, I've got you a flight to Rundu. He says, but the bad news is I haven't got you, I couldn't get you onto any other flight between Grootfontein and Pretoria. I can get you from Rundu to Grootfontein, but I can't get you any flights from Grootfontein to Pretoria. So I said, but I have a plan for you. I said, if you don't disembark in Grootfontein, they're not going to know. He says, but if you disembark, they won't let you back on again. He says, but if, if you just stay on the plane when it lands in Grootfontein, 
you just stay there and, and it should be all right. So I said, thank you. Thank you, Major. So I go to the hospital now. I say to them, listen, man, I'm taking this monkey with me. I'm taking him home. Uh, can you give me a sleeping tablet or something that I put this tape out when we go home? So they said to me, yeah, I suggest though that you don't give him more than a quarter tablet. Well, I gave this, my monkey, Oxloy, I gave her the, the sleeping tablet, but it didn't really do much for her. So we get to Groot van Tienen. I promise I don't get off the plane. I just sit there. About 20 minutes later, a whole, probably a uh, lot of uh, Bokkoppe, they get onto the plane. And uh, the chaplain comes and sits next to me. He's an English chaplain, and he's probably my dad's age. He comes and he sits next to me. So we take off from Groot van Tienen. Now we're flying to Pretoria. About 10 minutes into the flight, this Floyd, I had him in my medic bag. I had her in my medic bag, but she dropped a cock that pongs that whole plane out. So I'm sitting there embarrassed next to the, the, the chaplain. So I said to the chaplain, I said to him, I'm terribly sorry. It must be something I ate. But I could see he just looked at me suspiciously, you know. And, uh, but I, I, I just keep my mouth shut and I, I'll be flying again. Ten minutes later, Floyd sticks his hand out the bag and he reaches out towards me and I see this this uh, chaplain, he looks over and he, he looks at this and he looks at me and he says to me, you know what, you should have killed it before you ate it. <laughs> so I made it back to, to uh, Pretoria and reported to military intelligence again. And after that, um, the colonel used to I used to go on many more operations where they, when they just needed people, and I'd, I'd sometimes go up and there would be a convoy of 100 trucks, and there'd be Tiffies driving those trucks as well, but I'd be invited to come along, and we'd drive, drive a hell of a lot of stuff up into, into Angola. Uh, some of the up operations were up to Rhodesia, where we, we take old, uh, I think when, uh, after John Foster, um, I think Tevi Buta um, realized that we had to help the uh, Rhodesians again, you know, and um, we used to take old bedfords that were sat and they just spray them like light blue or light green on, and that and load it full of ammo. And we then drive the trucks up on a Friday night. Throughout the night, we drive up to Bite Bridge and then um, a combi would follow us and then all the drivers would get back into the combi and then they'd bring us back to Pretoria. But these trucks were so stuck that I had one truck that uh, at warm bath, the, the, the petrol cable snapped. So I had to open the bonnet, which was in between the two seats, and throttle that thing all the way up to Bite Bridge from warm bath all the way up to Bite Bridge. I was hand throttling the thing. So, uh, yeah, that's that. And then whilst I was in Pretoria as well, the colonel, often the, uh, the Dr. Savimbi came down to Pretoria and I think he met with P.A.B. Abuta and those people as well. And he always stayed in a house with, there were three or four small houses uh, at Klapa Kop, And those were guest houses that, that uh, the CIA or Dr. Savimbi or visitors like that uh, lived in. And uh, when Dr. Savimbi came, I would have to, I was then Dr. Savimbi's personal bodyguard, and he would have his own bodyguards with him, Unita guys, and there would be five or six of them, and they'd live in one of these houses. And I would then, Dr. Savimbi, he didn't mind us getting food from uh, the Manasi for him, but he often asked that they uh, provide raw steaks to me, and then I had to braai them for him. He liked uh, his braai. And so I, I'd often do that. And um, and then whilst he was in his visit there, um, they'd make appointments for him to go and see, like he, on one occasion he had to go and see somebody for specs. Uh, in, 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 and they never never saw Afrikaans doctors in, in Pretoria, but I, they always had Jewish doctors in Jeppe Street, Johannesburg. And so I'd take him for his, his dentist appointments and, and eye, eye appointments. I'd take Dr. Savimbi into Jeppe Street in Johannesburg, and he would have civvies on, I'd have civvies on, and people didn't even recognize him. They wouldn't, didn't know. And uh, on one of these occasions as well was when uh, 
uh, I picked up uh, the colonel at his house and uh, I had Dr. Savimbi with me and I took them to Johannesburg to a theater in De Villiers Street in Johannesburg. And they sit there and watch the theater. I sit outside in the car and uh, after theater, I take them back to the colonel's house and we'd have a nightcap. And, uh, and then I take Dr. Savimbi back to Clapper Fork. And th that was that. And then once a month, the colonel used to give me an army car and he'd give me like bottles of red wine and he said to me because he had some contacts that he wanted to service one service every month and I'd have to take them this expensive red wine from the Cape and then when I when I when I delivered these guys wine to them they'd, they'd always be very very kind and say come in come inside you want a katumba want a katumba yes thank you very much and I'd have a wine and coke and then the next morning the, co the colonel would say to me did you give me the Give the wine to those guys. I said, yes, yes, Colonel. Said, Did they put Coca-Cola in that expensive wine again? I said, yes, Colonel. These bloody uncultured bastards, they just have to drink wine. <laughs> so that was um, that was what I did uh, uh, with. And then later on, um, I sort of parted ways with the Colonel he, he misunderstood things. But what happened is that Tony, who was my best friend basically on the border, um, his, his clearing uh, expired. His top security clearance expired. His top secret clearance expired. And he had to, he gave me up as a reference for, uh, for renewing his, his uh, security clearance. Now, whilst I was up in Arundu, I often, had to admonish Tony because he being a radio man, he, he got every month, he got the, the radio codes for every day. They'd have three dials and he'd have the number for the frequencies of every dial in a radio book. Now, the problem with that is that everybody's on the same grid. So if one radio book is compromised, then the whole border, everybody with a radio is compromised. And we had black cleaners cleaning the toilets and I'd often, I'd, I'd come back from a mission and then I'd see the, the jeep standing at the toilet and I'd get out and I'd look for the radio book and find the radio book underneath the seat. And I'd admonish Tony and say to him, listen, Tony, that's not good enough. You know, that's not good uh, safety practice or security practice to have. The, you must always have the book with you. Take it into the shower. And you don't have to put it where it's going to be wet, but it must be under your control all the time. You can't have that book lying in the, in the, in the, under the seat and you're in the bathroom. At, and but he'd never listened. So when they asked me the question whether I thought he was security conscious, I was between the devil and the deep blue sea because I still had two brothers that hadn't been called up for national service. And I thought to myself, you know, if I didn't say anything here and anything happened to any of my brothers that affected security, a uh, breach of security, it would be on my head and I wouldn't be able to live with myself if that happened. So I, I spoke up and I said, no, he's, he, he isn't security conscious. Now, the, the colonel never forgave me for that. He, today, he's a retired general, Philippe Saman Dupria. Um, um, and he's, I, the last I heard, he was head of the Gunners Association. He was a gunner as well. So, um, yeah, he, he didn't want to speak to me after that. So. Um, and after that, I did, uh, I did, I did a few camps uh, before I started my own business. Um, and then once I had my own, I, I started a, a, a welding business, which then eventually I turned into a, a building business, and I was employing more than 100 people. So once I was employing those numbers of people, the army uh, declared me territory bound, so that because my role in providing employment was far more important for them than than doing camps. So that's basically my service in the army, of course. Man, I really enjoyed this. I never knew that uh, you know, Ail Copper military intelligence was so, uh, such an act of war, you know, because people never spoke about it. So, so I wish to thank you. And I have a lot of questions. But first, I must mention two things. Um, you people wouldn't believe what, what requests we get here at Legacy. And I really love this. This is fantastic. But I've 
had requests for Colonel Diederik's book, Didi's, his book, which he wrote, I think it's Journey Without End or something like that. Um, and the, that book is, is quite scarce. Uh, Journey Without Border, sorry, that's its name. And it's quite scarce because it's sort of out of print. And then one, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, somebody writes to me and says, hey, I found this book. So if, you, if you're looking for Colonel Diederik's book, then just let me know. And I will probably be able to, to tell you where you can find it. I haven't followed it up myself, but apparently that's where the book is. It is still available if you want it. And then secondly, I have. Yeah. I'm listening. I do have. I do have a copy of Didi's book. I'm actually. I, I would love to get in contact with Don van Sale if he if he if he's out there still somewhere. I thought. I thought that Don. I, I, I was under the impression that Don had perhaps um, was killed in action um, at Operation Crop Days, but Crop Days happened a year before I was in the border. That happened in 1977, and I was there in '78. So the, the fun sale that died at Croft date was an F-tier fun sale. I think Don was a D something. I, and I, I'd like to get in contact with Don again. Well, I'm sure we can arrange that if he's alive. I will spread the word amongst the Special Forces people. He definitely did not die at Croft if We made uh, the AK episodes and his name was not there. There were no Don fun sale who died that day. So it could not have been. You're quite right. Then on a more personal note, you know, this place in Thailand is just a stepping stone for us. We're looking for a Samuel 50, Samuel 50, Rebecca and myself. And what we want to do with that vehicle is to convert it at the back. Not that I have a knowledge to do it, but there will be people. And then we just want to travel Southern Africa, looking for the Africa Legacy Headquarters. Uh, but that's in the future. That's, I would say we have to finish here off with with uh, Thailand first, which is like a stepping stone for us to learn the tricks of a trade. But I want to ask you something here. Have you ever seen in those days any evidence of Unita poaching elephants or selling ivory, things like that? Yes, of course. Um, uh, I had an elephant tooth, um, which I gave to my electrician when I left. I, I had an elephant tooth. I I, it wasn't widespread in the beginning. It apparently became far more widespread afterwards. But when I was on, in, in the Caprivi, there were elephant herds that were probably 400, 500 elephants strong. I once uh, came around the corner with a, the Tony was driving a Magira's Deutsche truck, and I came around the corner. He drove around the corner, and I could hear this trumpeting noise. And as as we came around that bend, there was a whole herd of elephants busy crossing the road, and a young male bull was charging us and I had my feet up on the dashboard thinking how the thing's going to hit us any minute when it ran past us into the bush. Um, and the other thing I can tell you about elephants as well that in the Caprivi, you see uh, uh, when it rains, then there's, there's, there's ponds in the, in the road and you, you see a pond that was probably about 12 foot in diameter and you think, well, this thing's only probably about a foot deep. And then when you enter that dam, you're up to the dashboard in water because the elephants roll in that mud and they, they bath in that, in that pond. So although it looks like it's a small, shallow pond, those elephants hollow those things out and they, they're deep. They're very deep. But yes, I, I said, there, was, there were times where, 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 I, where uh, there were some colonels and that that were, you could see that they were there on shooting expeditions and I get to Camp Delta, and there'd be there'd be colonels, and they would be slaughtering elands and 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 kudu and stuff that they'd hunted. Um, when we were on the border with the or, or in the Caprivi, we the Caprivi actually is a nature reserve, so uh, we had big plastic um, containers, uh, uh, fridges on the or they were like fridges on the back of the Unimog. And they then load them full of biltong, and sometimes I think that they probably had ivory in them as well that went went back back uh, to to South Africa uh, in the flossing. Um But I think it became more common practice after I was there. But I certainly had a, a one elephant tusk that that Savimbi gave me. Um, 
and and it's it's quite feasible. I I remember on one of the one of those trips, we had to go and shoot for to feed the UNITA, and there was an experienced sergeant, and he said to five or six of us, he said, "Listen, come, we're going to shoot, we're going to shoot some for some meat for 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 the UNITA guy." So we drove off into the Caprivi and we driven just. 10 minutes or so, and there was a herd of buffalo, but they charged off and they stormed off, and the colonel, the, the sergeant said to me, stop, 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 stop. So he says, you, you five guys, come here with me. So he says, the buffalo doesn't run far. You, they'll be here somewhere. So we followed them in, and we'd gone about 50 yards, and there were three buffalo side on standing looking at us. And this sergeant had time to, to put us in a line, and he says, okay, you, you shoot for that buffalo, and he told us where to shoot it. And so we were two for each buffalo. And he said, okay, on my command, ready, aim, fire. And all three of those buffaloes went down. But I'll tell you what, we had a, a Bedford there. And I had probably about 40 or 50 Unita guys there. And you know that 50 Unita guys cannot lift a buffalo onto the back of a Bedford. There's no way. We had to quarter those things <laughs> to be able to load them up. But when, when you've... When they, they, they slaughtering meat like that, because I don't know about you, but I can't eat meat for a week after that. Well, I don't eat meat at all. You know, we, um, we're vegans here. So, so, but I know what you mean. Yeah. You, you smell that blood, you know, it is, it's a horrible smell. It is really not, it's not nice. Yes. But now I want to ask you something oh, I believe... else. Yes. Yes. I believe that, that I, I actually believe that they did. I, I, I read reports as well that uh, Ramalu and uh, Lodge were involved in taking ivory back to Southwest Africa and back into back to South Africa as well. And that this did fund the UNITA's war. The, 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 the income from ivory sales uh, funded their war. I also know there were occasions that. I had to pick up the, where the colonel said to me when I was in Angola, when, in Angola, he said to me, listen, there'll be a, a white guy with um, a Seattle life there, and they would be surveyors uh, working for Anglo-America that we picked up. And so I know that they probably paid for their war effort with um, blood diamonds as well. With. There's no doubt about it. I mean, the rumors and things came out. The only doubt there was and still is, is how far the South African army was involved with these things. And we don't really know. Definitely, there were things happening with military intelligence. Uh, but I don't know. But those files are closed. If somebody here knows, they, they, they're welcome to come and tell us. Yes. When, when you left, you, you, said, you said you spoke just before you went to the border. You went to see some officers. Um, you mentioned the name Neil Barnott. Uh, did you mean the chief yes. of the National Intelligence Service, or did, was it another Barnard? I think it's, it might be another Barnard, but he was always a guy that wore uh, civilian clothes. He had blue eyes, a wavy uh, brown hair, and we used to call him Pretty Boy because he always had a had a suit and a tie on. <laughs> but I think he was a colonel. When you're up there, did, did you ever actually met the CIA? Because they were around, there's no doubt that the CIA were operating in that area, but they were being kept away, definitely. Have you ever met one of them, an American, who has no real explanation why he's there? There, there? there were on occasions, there were CIA people that came and were sitting in the in the lounge area in, that, uh, in our Wendy hut, and they were meeting with the colonel. The colonel... Um, because we got, we got cigarettes and stuff for nothing. The colonel never wanted to smoke it. But when I got there, the first thing the colonel said to me, he said, Andrew, do you smoke? I said, no, no, colonel, I don't smoke. So he said to me, okay, well, I don't want to carry cigarettes on me, but I, now and then I like to puff on a Chesterfield. So he said to me, you always make sure that you've got Chesterfield and a lighter in your pocket. And if I reach out, you put a cigarette in my hand. So I used to have to light the colonel's cigarettes and put them in his hand, but he didn't want to carry them. I had to carry them. And eventually, you know, I uh, got bored when driving. We, we used to, when our missions, used, we used to drive and not sleep for 36 hours at a go, you know, and you slap yourself in the face to keep yourself awake and eventually you take a cigarette and eventually I was hooked on smoking. I stopped smoking when I came to Australia. It was too expensive. 
how far was the rules relaxed? I mean, when you were, when you see an entire aircraft coming in with food and weapons and supplies, ammo for UNITA, was there any signing of paperwork or anything, or was it just, okay, offload and off you guys go? It was, um, the, the CIA didn't provide food. The, the, our army provided the food. We got the food from the kitchen. It, it was mostly, it was, um, it was ammunition and, and arms and ammunition that was offloaded at, um, at, the, um, uh, at the airport. And I, I can't recall us ever having to sign for anything. What type of weapons were this from Vietnam and, and the aircraft involved? Would that have been uh, civilian type of, 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 of carriers? No, it was our, our uh, um, C-34s were flying, they were flying up to the Congo and pick the stuff up and bring it back to Rundu. And the arms, I don't know what they were in crates. Or, uh, uh, so I never, I never saw what type of arms and ammunition they were. They were just crates that I had to lie in. I, the colonel would say, you take so many of those crates, you take so many of those crates. But we had, and, and I also know that a lot of the ammunition, like AK-47 ammunition was actually manufactured at the uh, Pretoria Metal um, PMP factory, and it, they just didn't put a stamp on it. But, but it was Dinkum AK-47 uh, rounds. What, was, what they also did is the Rekis, when they, the Rekis would inter, infiltrate uh, Swapo bases, and then they'd pick up, or the Cuban bases, and they'd pick up their um, tins of fish, and they'd bring that tin of fish back uh, to South Africa and Krijgkor, I think that they um, manufactured tins that looked exactly like that, that you couldn't tell the difference between them. And they put them full of that um, pre-detonated charges so that when the guy, when he opens that tin, then it explodes in his face. And the, the Rekis would infiltrate and put those things in the camp. You know, and these things, these guys would think that they're opening a can of pulches and it would blow up in their faces. Yeah, there's no doubt that happened too. I, I remember... Skulk for was telling us, training people, we they had like uh, explosives, it looks like butter. And they would get uh, yes. the swap room, they must have put it right in the mess of the pilots. And quite a few of these Cuban pilots then, well, you know, they shouldn't have been eating butter anyway. So, but, but, but things happened to them there. So that, that was quite a thoroughly nasty, dirty war going on. But you said to me that you people were moving Military intelligence were moving UNITA units around to the different battlefields. Uh, may I ask how that happened? Uh, what was the logistics behind it? In the beginning, there, there were very few drivers for UNITA. So we often did. We'd, we'd go pick them up and move them to wherever they had to go next. And um, I... I'd see, I'd, I'd see uh, there because I'd be following another truck and then I'd watch these guys on the other truck. You know, they, they, they were so hungry, of course, that they, we had, we'd been moving milli meal and diesel and stuff. And so in the corrugation of the truck, you'd have dust and sand and leaves and bits of milli meal and diesel and that. These guys were so hungry, they would scrape the milli meal together and with the leaves and everything and eat that. And we always carried, like, if a diesel drum was empty, we'd fill it with water for the truck radiators if, if we needed, if we had a water leak so that we had water to put into the truck. And these guys would drink that water that was contaminated with diesel. They'd drink it. They were so thirsty. And they'd eat that. They were so thirsty. On the other hand, the wives in, uh, in Delta, the, the, the UNITA wives, were fat as pigs. They were well fed. And uh, they often... They often, be, when you're bundu bashing, when you've got a huge load like that and you're going through and you're bundu bashing, you know, you sometimes lose part of your load, you know, and you, you see in the rear view mirror, and, oh, hell, there's, there's a couple of boxes went overboard. So you'd stop and pick them up. And we took them wine as well. And often I'd stop in a whole bo box of wine and flung off the truck. And um, then it would be wasted. And that day, the, you need a woman complain to the colonel that uh, they thought that we were stealing their wine. You know? So the colonel came to us and he said to us, listen, in future, if, if a, a box break, a box of wine breaks, just pick up all the, the bottlenecks with the corks in it so that they could see you guys didn't take the corks out and drink the wine that actually was broken. You know? So we did that. And uh, 
uh, on one occasion, I, in, in our Delta camp, there was these, this fat woman, and I, I took the broken bottlenecks and gave it to this woman and said, yeah, these, these, these broke, you know, here, and she got cross, and she picked up an AK-47, and she fired off a couple of rounds. Fortunately, she was a bad shot, but the, she quickly was stopped by her own people and, um, and, uh, and left me alone. But, uh, but the contrast, you know, the, the poor soldiers, the young kids, and, and they really were kids. They were, they were 12, 30-year-old soldiers um, fighting as well. The other thing I, I forgot to mention, of course, is that eventually Swap and everybody but knew that we were helping UNITA. So whenever our guys took prisoners, sometimes um, the terrorists would say, no, no, I'm not, I'm not with Swap, I'm with UNITA. And on one such occasion, the, the, the colonel... He had, he had an F-10 truck, and the colonel said to Tony and myself, listen, take this guy over the river in the rubber ducky and take him to the UNITA base just a couple of days on the other side of the river. So, man, this, I, I, I didn't think. Was <clears throat> so I, we tied this guy's hands together and put it behind his back, and we put him on the, on the truck with him propped up against the... The, the back window of the of the cab and Tony was driving and I got onto the back at the tailgate end and Tony pulled off and as he picked up sp speed the dust on the back of the truck blew up into my eyes and I couldn't see and I thought to myself oh hell what can I do now because I can't shoot him because if I shoot him it's going to go through the cab and I'll kill Tony you know and I thought hell if this guy knows He's going to make a move on me now. And to this day, I don't know why he didn't make a move because we were taking him to his death. We eventually got him across. He never made a move. We eventually got him across the river and the UNITA guys interrogated him. And I, at that stage, I couldn't understand what they were saying or anything, but they just two or three short questions. And they obviously could see that this guy wasn't UNITA. And a, a UNITA guy picked up an AK-47 with a, with a bayonet on it, and he ended the guy's life just there in front of us. It's a cruel thing, War. It's a cruel, cruel thing, which is why it must be avoided. You know, I get scared when I hear these latest breed of politicians just talking lightly about war. It's because we've never been there. I know that the American... Uh, House of Representatives, in the old days, just after the Second World War and before, about three quarters of them actually served in the military. Or at least as their uncle or something in the military. Today, there's less than, I think, 5%. So we have absolutely no idea about what war contains. And people die in war. It's a horrible thing. Now, we have a lot of foreigners looking, looking at our show. And thank you, all of you. You're welcome here. But they might not understand certain terminology which we use and which we of course understand and we understand the reasons so may i ask you andrew why did you people use bundu bashing with your vehicles why didn't you just go on the road okay well because of landmines so you basically to avoid landmines you make your own road every time you go you you basically take a compass bearing and then you head off in the direction that you want to go because you know that the roads are mined, and you're sure as hell going to get a mine if you're into into Angola on a road. So, and you didn't. We didn't have time to for somebody to sweep the roads before we went. We were on missions every. We worked seven days a week. With we slept very little. We worked seven days a week. A lot of times, as I said to you, you know, you drive 36 hours one go, and then perhaps grab eight hours sleep, and then. Do another 36 hours back. And these vehicles, is back in this, in the late 1970s now, they don't have air con and things like that. I mean, it's just you and, and the heat, which is something dreadful in that part of Africa. Yes. 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 Uh, some of the bedfords had a, had a, had a, had a two lid, had a lid, two lid. I, I must tell you a story. Oh, Tony's driving, and I'm standing in this, in this, um, this and now I'm now I've got, I've got, I'm through the turret, and I'm standing with my R1 outside. Now I'm 
I'm going to, man, if something comes for us, I'm going to sh shoot. And as I look ahead, there's this huge spider between the two trees, and he's hanging straight in my path. So I try to get back into the bed pit, but I'm stuck. I can't get back down. I can only go one way, and that's over the top. So I threw my R1 over, and I jumped off, and I rolled. Did a dike roll, dive roll onto the sand. Here's the French factor and the small spider <laughs> gets me off the truck. <laughs> no, that's fantastic to hear, you know. I I have respect, of course, for South African military vehicles. I mean, the punishment these vehicles took and just continue it, even to this day, is fantastic. I mean, but you've got a job to do. It's not... It's not on purpose. I mean, we have to say to the toughies too before they get angry. Uh, when you need to get somewhere with supplies, you need to get there. End, end of story. There's nothing, nothing. What else must you do? Yep. But but how do you feel? I mean, I don't want to sound racist, then I'm not. But in those days, if you see a black guy with a rifle, you shoot. <laughs> It's not, it's just the way it was in those days. And, and you people were constantly working with UNITO with black guys and good people, all of them with rifles. There's some kind of uh, wondering inside you when, when these guys are going to turn on you. No, I tell you that what that was one of the biggest problems we had, of course, is that um, you couldn't tell by a guy's uniform on which side he was because the MPLA had a, had, had, had a one camouflage uni, uh, uniform. Um, we eventually started, we supplied UNITA with a uh, bottle green uh, brown, or well, they were the, the same as our browns, but they were bottle green. But they, they also, in the beginning, were supplied with ex World War II uniforms. And the tr trouble is, you know, these guys fight each other. And in, if, if, if you went into those small towns in southern Angola, you'd say you'd see Viva the MPLA painted in blue and then Viva Unita painted in red and then crossed out Viva uh, MPLA. Um, and when these guys fought each other, when you shoot and you're cold, eh? so you, now you shoot an MPLA guy dead. And then you go through, his, you rummage through his stuff and you say, yes, well, here's a nice jacket that I can wear. I'm not going to, I'm going to wear this jacket. So everybody was wearing a bit of everybody else's uniform, except the South Africans. They had browns, you know, but the UNITA wore a mixture of uniforms. The uh, uh, MPLI generally didn't, uh, wore the, they wore a mixture of uniforms. Swapa wore a mixture of uniforms. The Cubans wore their uniform, but... Uh, as for the MPLA and Swapo and UNITA, they all wore a mixture of uniforms. And that's why it was very difficult to tell. If a guy said to you, no, I'm with UNITA, then you couldn't look at his uniform and say, no, man, you're talking the rubbish me. I have a question which I think everybody is wondering now. What happened to Floy the Ark? I took Floy home and uh, I he, he lived for many years with me um with uh, my dad in fact um i i took him back to my family and, and we kept rabbits and our floor used to jump into the rabbit cage and he'd run up to a rabbit and grab it and put it under his arm and then he'd grab another rabbit and he'd be like in a scrum in the winter you know he'd be in the middle between these two rabbits to keep himself warm and he he terrorized the whole neighborhood because i never put him in a cage i i kept him free and it, in those days, they delivered milk and orange juice. You, you just put out two plastic discs and they delivered it and put it on the pavement, you know. And our Floyd would run down the street and he, <laughs> he'd take the tin foil caps off all the milk bottles and then drink as far as his tongue goes. In. And my, old, of my poor father had to pay the neighbors off every week for, for the damage Floyd caused. <laughs> and he lived with us many years until eventually one day... Um, uh, he got caught by nature conservation. And I saw Floy again just before I came to Australia, but he didn't recognize me anymore. But he was in Jacksel's snake park at the Harabia Sport Dam. He was there because the um, the blow up, the, the, the vervet monkey from Angola is a yellowish color, whereas our vervet monkeys in South Africa were gray. It wasn't violent, this was this ape of yours, because I recall I was at Cape Point once, and there were a bunch of baboons there, and they chased some Swiss tourists around. It was actually wonderful to see. I really enjoyed it. Um, but these these things can actually, I mean, 
and there's no other option. They, they, they quick, they, they come for you. Yes, yes, no, but the 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 the, the vervet monkey is much smaller than a baboon. So, but they can. They, they I mean, it, he would sometimes uh, attack my youngest brother uh, and bite him. Uh, <laughs> um, but we lived in a in a double story house, and he would run on the roof and he he grab the gutter, and then swing down and 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 and, and drop into a tree, you know, and and, and often. He'd miss the gutter and he'd come flying and you could see he turn around and the look on his face was like, oh, shit. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's great for me to see the fun elements as well. But then you left for Australia and I think you did rather well there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Australia and your paintings? Well, um, I don't know if you've seen, there's another YouTuber in Australia, his name is Scott Bolton, uh, and he's the truth. All the paintings that I've made, except, except for the giraffe, I have donated to Scott Bolton, and he auctions them to raise funds for the, the white farmers in South Africa that, uh, that during COVID weren't being fed, but the black farmers were being fed. And all the people in the white squatter camps in South Africa, all, I donate those paintings so that they get auctioned for that cause. And I did, yeah, I, I came to Australia and uh, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a while. I was the sales manager of a medical devices company. Uh, but I also, I, I reset my trade test um, at the stage here and then uh, did my, uh, I did a, I first, first in South Africa, the banks always asked me for a business plan. I didn't know what they were talking about. I decided when I came to Australia that I would study um, a BCom degree so that I could at least know what a business plan was. And I did I did a BCom degree and then followed that up and did my MBA and then also did um, the uh, building qualification. So I got my certificate for as a low rise builder. But um, I work basically for an, an, an investment company that buys investment properties. I do all the maintenance work for them and they they buy investment houses and uh, investment properties like shopping centers and that. Uh, and I do all the maintenance for them. That's how I work uh, and uh, enjoying myself. Uh, but yeah, you know, you do everything yourself. If you're a bricklayer, you don't have anybody that mixes your dagger for you. You do your own mixing and carrying your own bricks and everything you do yourself. Which I think is a good thing, actually. I think it's good that you are, you know, in control of the entire process. Yes, yes. Well, obviously, you won't steal from yourself. You, you'd be surprised how much losses I had in South Africa through theft. I, I used to build in the townships, and uh, the the company that I subcontracted to um, used to. They used to take the houses from the in the location, and then the bank would finance. Uh, me to build a garage and two rooms and then they transfer that out over to the black guy that, that, that was occupying it and then he had a bond to pay back you know so often there was only about a meter between the fence and the house that i was building and i was tackling nine ten projects at a time i had diff nine different teams building and one day i turned around and i saw a guy pass a bag of cement over the fence and a bottle of beer came back to him, you know, and I realized to myself, this is happening here where I am. Imagine what's happening where I'm not. And I, on paper, I was making money, but in practice, I wasn't making money. Because, and so I eventually stopped working in the townships. Yeah, that's a problem, you know, because people think it's just a bag of cement and it's, you know, but it actually does affect the bottom line. You have to have control. That's right. And then uh, with these subcontractors working for me, they often didn't have all the specialized tools. So I'd lend them some of my tools, you know, and on one occasion, I'd lent my mortise and lock machine out to one of the builders. And he, because he wasn't paying his, his blocks, they stole my machine. So I asked the driver, I said to him, do you know where this guy lives? And he said, yes. I said, come with me. I'm going to arrest him. So I, he took me to this guy's house and I knocked on the door and he opened the door and I said, I'm arresting you right here. And I said to my driver, go and fetch the police. And he just left 
when this guy started performing in his yard. And I soon had about 400 guys vying for my blood in the street. Now, I had a pistol with me, uh, worth that had uh, seven rounds of ammo in the magazine and one in the chamber. And I thought to myself, well, if these guys come for me now, it's six for them and one for me. But uh, fortunately, nothing happened. They didn't make a break with that. I never let them see my firearm because then they kill you just for that firearm. You know? So I kept it in my pocket. I had my hand on it in my pocket. And about an hour later, the police arrived and a short constable, he was probably only about five foot tall, he just summed up who the ringleaders were and he walked up and he gave one guy a smack in the chops and they dispersed. <laughs> Yeah, I was crapping myself. Yeah, well, they know their own area, you know. They know who, how to deal with. I, I recall there were certain pops in Pretoria in my time where there were always a disturbance. And then you just walk in and you move your way all the way to the front of the bartender and you ask what's the problem. And there's a trail of guys lying down behind you. And then there's no problem further. Uh, it, it might sound yeah. very public to certain people, but, but those techniques actually work. Yes. Now, today you have holsters, plastic holsters that, that you have to press a button to unlock your, to get the firearm out of the holster. But in those days, we had leather holsters. Uh, and I soon learned, working in the township, that I mustn't holster my, my firearm if you're right-handed on your right hip. You must holster it on your left hip so that the butt of the, the pistol shows to the front. Because I had an electrician that worked for me, and he had his firearm on his right hip and you know when you're working in the townships everybody basically you you've chambered around all you have to do is pull the safety down and then you can fire and this guy was working on a db board uh, outside a house um, that was being built and a guy walked up behind him pulled his firearm out of his holster and shot him in the back and killed him so i quickly learned you put your you put your firearm on your left hip yeah, it just gives you a little bit of um, extra time. But do you think that your army experience yeah. was was positive? If you're looking back now, would you have go and do it again under the same conditions, of course? Yes, yes. Well, I think that it gave me it. It, it really made us better. Uh, I I was a manager in the pharmaceutical. Uh, at the age of 22, I was a manager of the people that were in their 50s and 40s. Yeah, that comes that just comes from discipline. You know, you know, you know how to talk to people. You know how to give give instructions, and you know how to be firm. And the last question for you: We were speaking about Tony and his lack of awareness of security consciousness, and it's very serious. I must tell you, people: If, if I find a guy who betrays any type of secret or, or takes it uh, like a diesel type of attitude, he's out. He's gone. I will not work with him. He's dangerous. Now, on a personal level, I got on with Tony like a house on fire, but I couldn't not say anything uh, about his security lapses uh, and, and live with a clear conscience that if something happened to one of my brothers, I would not live with myself, Chris. That's what I was aiming at, to ask you. Your brothers did survive the war. Nothing happened to them. No, I, my, my, I have a twin brother, an identical twin brother, and he actually he went to Rao University and did a, a, a electronics uh, degree, a, a degree in electronic engineering, and he got his master's degree in electronic engineering, and he eventually ended up um, instead of going into the army, he did he went to Heidelberg uh, for basics, and then after that he worked in Denel and he worked on the Hopper radio, and he. When after um, finishing with the army, he used the same technology that they used on the Hopper radio to um, to manufacture car alarms, which we then sold to Delta Motor Corporation, which was General Motors and Opel. And we also supplied uh, systems to the South African Defence Force and Allied Publishing. Well, it's always good for me to hear a success story. But I think we have to end it now. This was really fascinating okay. to me. I want to thank you uh, once again, Andrew, 
I know we've had some difficulties getting hold of each other, but it was worth it. It was worth it. And for the rest of you listening here, I always invite you here at the end. Come and talk to me. Don't let your story die with you. Let us create our own legacy, which we control. And until we meet again, God bless. Thank you, Chris.